Susan Burkhauser, and I'm a researcher for RHEL Midwest. We're so glad to have you here. Please take a moment to select your role from the poll if you've not already done so. And please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. All right, let's get started. Um, on the next slide, okay, before we begin, I wanna share a few pointers about the Zoom platform. You can connect to audio by clicking join audio in the Zoom toolbar. Click on the chat box to introduce yourself, but you can use the chat box to also ask questions from, of the presenters. You can also use the chat box to let us know if you're having any technical issues. Note that you can select an option to either send a comment to the presenters or to all attendees. I also wanna point out that live closed captioning is available during the webinar. To see the captions, click on closed caption. From my experience participating in webinars while in the home environment, I highly recommend that everyone take a moment now to select the closed captioning option. It can be helpful as the audio may vary during the webinar. We are recording today's webinar. The recording and all event materials will be archived on the RHEL Midwest website. We will send an email with a link to the video as soon as it becomes available to all those who registered for today's webinar, but please go ahead and forward that to anyone who you think might benefit from the recording. Next slide. We encourage you to ask the presenters questions at any time during the webinar. You can do this by using the chat box and typing your questions there, but you can also tweet your questions at RHEL Midwest, and please use the hashtag competency-based. Great. Next slide. I'm pleased to introduce our presenters for today's webinar. We have Christina Zeiser, a senior researcher at American Institute for Research. Lisa Bellotta, the director of curriculum and instruction at Ridgewood High School in Norwich, Illinois. Eric Lasky, STEM division head at Ridgewood High School in Norwich, Illinois. We have Jeff Playman, online and digital learning specialist at the Minnesota Department of Education. And Sally Reynolds. Alternative and Extended Learning Specialist at the Minnesota Department of Education. Next slide. Our agenda for today's webinar is that we'll start with a welcome and overview of RHEL Midwest and learn more about who's attending the webinar today. We'll then dive into our topic. Dr. Zeiser will prevent, present an overview and key findings from a study that examines the relationship between competency-based education practices and students' learning skills, behaviors, and dispositions. Lisa Blotta and Eric Lasky will share their firsthand experience using competency-based education strategies to support at-risk students, including their lessons learned. And Jeff Clayman and Sally Reynolds will share how the Minnesota Department of Education is supporting state-approved alternative and online learning programs implementing competency-based education. Following each presentation, I will facilitate a question and answer session with the presenters. And as a reminder, you can submit questions for the presenters in the Zoom chat box, or you can tweet them at RHEL Midwest using the hashtag competency-based. Okay, so let's see who's attending today. Okay, great. It looks like we have a wide variety of roles in our audience today. And again, we're so happy you could all join us. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, all right. RHEL Midwest is part of a network of 10 regional educational laboratories funded by the U.S. Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences. Next slide. RHEL Midwest serves seven Midwest states, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. To address the priorities and interests of these states, RHEL Midwest supports five research alliances as well as other collaboration. Next slide. The work of these partnerships is developed in consultation with state education agency and district staff to address priority education issues in the region. Next slide. I wanna take a moment to provide a very brief overview of the work taking place in Minnesota under the Midwest Career Readiness Research Alliance, also known as MICRA, related to competency-based education. In the 2019-20 academic year, MICRA facilitated a networked improvement community of alternative learning centers. Educators in this networked improvement community focused on testing how to implement CDE strategies in their practice. 
In January 2020, RHEL Midwest hosted a webinar on CVE research for MICRA members and invited stakeholders. In the upcoming academic years, 2020 through 2022, MICRA will facilitate a virtual NIC of rural alternative learning centers, again, focused on CVE strategies. MICRA will facilitate two train the trainer technical assistance projects on implementing CVE practices. And MICRA will direct technical assistance for one Minnesota district on implementing CVE practices at scale. Okay, next slide. We would also like to know how familiar everyone is with competency-based education. Please go ahead and select the best option from the poll on your screen. We'll give you about 30 seconds. Okay, great. So it looks like every, almost everyone has some understanding, maybe about 7% the first time hearing about it. Well, welcome. We're glad you came to check it out and see what's going on. Um, and then we do have a few experts in the audience. Great. Okay, well, with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Zeiser. Thanks again for joining us today. Thanks, Susan. Um, Again, I'm Chrissy Zeiser at AIR, and I'm excited to present to you today about our study looking under the hood of competency-based education. Um, and I wanted to make sure to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Aaron Haynes, Wendy Sir, Catherine Bitter, Lauren Clymer, uh, and Ray Yang, who all contributed to this research. Okay, next slide. Uh, before I get into the nitty gritty of the research, I wanted to tell you how we define competency-based education because we recognize that there are a wide range of definitions out there in the field and in the research literature. And as we reviewed that literature, we came up with six key features of CBE that uh, we use to define how we uh, conceptualize uh, competency-based education. First, uh, CBE schools have learning targets. Uh, that are explicit and they're shared with students, sometimes with student families, and they're rigorous, uh, making sure that it's not just a checkbox of what students must learn, but making sure that those standards are rigorous and again, explicitly shared with students uh, so that they have a clear understanding of what is expected of them, both within a specific assignment, within a subject area, and throughout the year. Second, the measurement of learning is based on mastery, not based on effort, time. Um, I think that this is a big contrast with how we conceptualize traditional schooling, where seat time equals learning. Uh, for, uh, in a competency-based education setting, a student has not achieved, um, cannot progress to the next level until they have, can demonstrate that they have achieved mastery. Third, uh, we have instructional approaches and supports that are individualized. They're relevant to students based on their needs and their preferences. They're varied so that not all students in the same classroom are re receiving the same instructional practices, or at least they're getting a variety of experiences. Um, and it offers students independence and responsibility for their own learning. Uh, so there are many ways in which this can be done, uh, advising for students, one-on-one -on -one, uh, advising, use of technology to individualize learning, use of project-based learning, uh, and offering a wide variety of options uh, to students within the classroom. Fourth, assessment of learning. Uh, the assessment of learning in a CDE classroom offers students flexibility, not only in the modality of how they are assessed, so they could have a, um, they could have a presentation at the end of uh, a, a section of what they are learning. They can put together a paper, they can present their learning to the class, or they can have a collaborative uh, group work project or a portfolio. There's a wide variety of ways in which students may demonstrate their learning. And they're also given flexibility on when they can be assessed and if they can retake the assessment. Uh, because again, uh, really the measurement of learning is based on achieving mastery. Uh, Fifth, kind of going right uh, from that, pacing and progression in CBE is flexible. And I think this is really the defining feature out there of competency-based education, is that uh, we assume that in a CBE setting, students can move uh, forward as quickly as uh, they can achieve mastery, or students may take additional time if there are certain subjects or certain topics that they require additional time. 
um, in an ideal setting, uh, you would be able to, a student would be able to uh, progress faster in one subject than another, would be able to potentially go on to the next grade level before the next school year if they can demonstrate mastery. And finally, the sixth uh, feature of CBE is when and where learning takes place. Um, under this feature, under an ideal setting again, um, we would assume that CBE schools would let students achieve mastery through experiences that aren't necessarily in the classroom, in the school building, or during the school day. A lot of learning takes place outside of the school building, uh, maybe some service learning or work-based learning experience. Students may take a college-level course at a local community college. Um, and all of these experiences are ways in which students can both um, gain experience with a competency or learn content, uh, subject content, and uh, per perhaps taking those experiences, putting them in a portfolio, and using them to demonstrate how they have mastered that competency. So taken together, uh, these are the six key features of competency-based education uh, that we really looked at within our study. We can move to the next slide. Um, so to begin, I wanted to review, uh, sorry, when we designed the study, we wanted to examine exactly how CBE benefits students and what practices in the classroom, school, and district levels led to change for students. In other words, what links CBE to academic success for students? Uh, in looking at the literature, this is what we thought was a huge gap. How do we get from this school level intent to implement competency-based education to actually making a difference in student achievement. Uh, so this is the theory uh, that we followed for our study. First, we have schools that want to implement competency-based education. Um, at the school level, there are policies and practices that schools may encourage that teachers implement within the classroom. And so the, the second box here in the classroom, teachers are uh, perhaps implementing specific uh, CBE strategies, such as flexible pacing, such as allowing students to retake assessments. And then in the next box that uh, goes down to the student level, student experience of CBE. Um, here we want to make sure that there's a good connection. It's not just that uh, teachers are offering flexibility or teachers are offering a, a variety of instructional practices, but that students recognize that those opportunities are available and are taking advantage of those opportunities to improve their learning environment. And then uh, it is our theory that through those experiences, students would experience positive changes in learning capacity. Uh, learning capacities is probably a term that's unique to our study. Uh, other studies may call them 21st century skills, academic mindset. Uh, but the idea is if students see that their learning is relevant, that they're able to um, modify when they take assessments so that they feel more confident in demonstrating their learning to their teachers. It could improve their self-efficacy. It could improve their intrinsic motivation and their feelings that what they're learning in their class is relevant to their lives. And so that's what we mean by positive changes in students' learning capacities, which then ultimately we would hope would positively influence student outcomes, uh, course grades, test scores, and high school graduation, uh, the more typical measures of academic achievement that we might see in the literature. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so our study uh, was funded by the Nellie Mae Education Foundation and really sought to compare, well, how do classroom practices differ between competency-based education schools and non-CBE schools, as we define them here? Um, for the study, we did have a sample of CBE and non-CBE schools across three states. It is important to point out that we did not define schools as CBE schools. Uh, we really relied on state and local administrators to find for us a really well-implemented CBE school. Uh, these schools must have been implementing CBE for at least two years at the time that the study started, just to make sure that they've had the opportunity to work out some of the kinks and really be implementing with fidelity. Um, and for our study, we focused on the experiences and outcomes of students in grade nine to make sure that these are uh, students who are experiencing, experiencing competency-based education for the first time. Um, next slide, please. Uh, for our study, we collected survey data from both teachers and students. Oh, sorry, I guess I'm gonna report on the research question first. 
Uh, the research questions that our study uh, sought to examine, uh, we had three research questions. The first of the was, how do the uh, school policies and teacher practices differ across the CBE and non-CBE setting? Um, the second research question is, how do the student experiences differ? So, you know, first, is there a connection between what teachers report as their practices and what students are experiencing? And also, how did those experiences differ across the CBE and non-CBE setting? And third, um, what is the relationship between student CBE experiences and those learning capacities that I mentioned? Okay, next slide. So we collected, as I previously mentioned, we collected survey data for this study in order to really capture the teacher practices that were happening in CBE and non-CBE classrooms, as well as the um, student experiences of CBE and their learning capacities. We administered teacher surveys in 10 CBE and eight non-CBE schools uh, in spring of 2015 uh, in order to capture the practices at the end of the school year. So we're able to capture throughout the entire school year um, what was happening in the classroom. Similarly, the student survey was administered in spring 2015 in four CBE and non-CBE schools. Um, we also administered a fall survey to students, which only included the learning capacity. So the goal was to measure students' learning capacity throughout the ninth grade year. By subtracting the fall value from the spring value, we were able to measure change over time. And finally, we collected student-level administrative data uh, from the participating districts in order to, in our statistical model, control for student demographic characteristics and prior achievement. Um, it is not a causal study. We still say that everything in our, our research is correlational in nature, but we did try to account for differences in student background characteristics. Here I list the 16 um, student learning capacities that we examine in our study. I will not be able to provide a full description of each of the outcomes uh, in this format, but if you look at our report in box two, we do provide a short description of each of these outcomes. Uh, you probably recognize some of these outcomes from the literature. I, I will say that all of our measures of the student learning capacities did come from uh, prior surveys and the research literature. These are not AIR constructed outcomes. Um, so some of the outcomes that we looked at, at in the academic mindset realm is intrinsic motivation, locus of control, um, academic self-efficacy, utility motivation, uh, so these are really the ways that in which students approach learning, how they think of themselves as a learner, their beliefs that they can accomplish their own academic goals, and that they have control over their own future as locus of control uh, measures, um, and as well as how useful that they think what they're learning in school will be to their future. Next slide, please. Um, the next two uh, domains of student outcomes fall more into the student behavior um, side of the learning capacity. So student self-management, monitoring of their understanding, cognitive control, um, preparation and organization is like, do they come to class prepared to take notes? And then engagement, um, are they distracted in the classroom? Are they able to focus on their learning? Or is there something about their learning environment or their interest in the subject that prevents them from being fully engaged in the classroom? Um, so taken together, those are the 16 learning capacities that we examine in our study. Before I go into the findings, I just wanted to uh, present again the research questions. Again, first we're going to start with the teacher survey, comparing the teacher practices and school policies uh, that were uh, reported in the CBE and non-CBE setting. Then comparing and contrasting the students' experiences of the CBE practices based on the student responses to the survey. And then finally, looking at the relationship between the CBE experiences and their learning capacities. And here it's regardless of which school they attended, um, because as we'll see, uh, CBE practices may not be exclusive to CBE schools. Next slide. Okay, so how did the CBE and comparison schools differ? We can go ahead and hit the, uh, go to the first bullet point. Um, in essence, there were several areas in which teachers in CBE settings were more likely to report implementing CBE practices and policies. In particular, next bullet point. Um, these were the areas in which uh, we did find that teachers in CBE settings were more likely to report 
uh, implementing these CBE practices. So requiring students to demonstrate mastery, uh, the greater flexibility in retaking assessment, um, greater flexibility in pacing for students and greater use of technology, meeting with students individually to discuss their projects, having personalized learning plans for all students, not just for students who were uh, academically struggling, and uh, greater student input with instructional decision making. So some would call this um, like autonomy, giving students a bit more autonomy and decision making power within the classroom. Um, next slide, please. Um, what we did find, however, was that teachers in non-CBE settings were also uh, reporting many of these CBE policies and practices. And so, um, for example, uh, in both CBE and non-CBE settings, teachers were likely to say that students take primary responsibility for keeping track of their own learning and progress. Uh, I think about over half of the non-CBE teachers reported that they measure mastery of learning targets. And almost half uh, reported that students can retake summative assessments. And so those are some examples where we thought that we would, uh, we expected to see more differences between CBE and non-CBE settings, but actually a lot of these practices were popping up in the non-CBE schools as, as well. So overall, we did find that variation of teacher practices within schools was actually greater than the variation that we saw between schools. Um, and there are a lot of ways uh, that this variation could present itself. It could be by subject area. It could be based on teacher experience, um, whether they received specific training related to um, some of the practices that were being introduced. Um, we couldn't fully explain all of this variation, but ultimately the large amount of variation within schools prevented us from finding a lot of differences between schools. Next slide, please. Um, for our second research question, we wanted to better understand differences in students' experiences of CBE across school settings. Uh, overall, we did not find differences. Um, we did find two differences between the school settings in student reports. Um, can hit the thing for one more time. Um, we did find that students in CBE schools were more likely to have personalized learning plans, and they also were more likely to report meeting with adults regularly to discuss their learning. Uh, however, in all other areas, and there were a lot of areas that we looked at, uh, we did not find significant differences in student experiences between the CBE and non-CBE settings. In fact, uh, we did ask students separately about their math and English courses, and we often found differences across subject areas in student reports of what practices they were experiencing. For example, um, varied instructional approaches or the uh, ability to retake assessments. That might be something that's implemented by some teachers in some subjects, uh, but not others within, within the same school setting. And then, uh, for our third research question, we really wanted to explore, again, the relationship between students' CBE experiences and changes in their learning capacities, regardless of school classification. So just um, grouping together all students across the eight schools that were surveyed for the student survey, looking at individual uh, student experiences of CBE and how they relate to changes in their learning capacities. Uh, we found that not all CBE experiences were related to learning capacities, but we did find several trends. Um, I'm going to just present a few of them here, but if you're interested, Table 7 in our report provides um, information about all the significant uh, relationships that we found in our study. Next slide, please. Um, our first finding for research question three was that clear learning targets was related to positive changes in, in the greatest number of learning capacities. So for all of the learning capacities listed here, intrinsic motivation, utility motivation, self-management, engagement, all of these outcomes, we found that students who reported um, a greater agreement that they had clear learning targets were more likely to experience positive changes in these outcomes. Next slide. So our second finding was that intrinsic, for intrinsic motivation, there were several CBE experiences that predicted positive changes in intrinsic motivation. I've already mentioned clear learning targets, but also expectations that students must demonstrate mastery, flexible pacing and use of non-traditional assessments. So this was only true when we looked at those in math. Um, allowing credit for activities outside of school, and use of a variety of instructional practices. 
And then our final uh, finding for research question three that I will review today is that academic self, uh, some of these relationships were specific to math. So in particular, academic self-efficacy in math was related to uh, these CBE practices, the expectation that students must demonstrate mastery, flexible pacing, allowing students to retake summative assessments, and the variety of instructional practices. Um, but when we looked at ELA, these were not significant relationships. And so this really um, supported the idea that if you are looking at both implementation of CBE as well as how that might relate to student outcomes, it is important to keep uh, the subject in, in mind because especially for something like uh, self-efficacy, a student's self-efficacy in math may not be strongly related to their self-efficacy in other subject areas. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what were our takeaways? Uh, essentially, exposure to CBE practices shows promise for benefiting students uh, based on the relationships we found between uh, CBE experiences and changes in learning capacities. But using the CBE label is not enough to ensure that students will be exposed to the full range of CBE practices. Um, I provide information about the six key features of CBE that we looked at, and schools may label themselves as CBE before all of those, uh, those six features are fully implemented, uh, which is totally understandable because sometimes uh, policies are in the way that prevent full implementation on all six key features. Um, but just recognizing that just because a school is labeled as CBE doesn't mean that it is implementing all six key features to the highest uh, level. And um, in essence, consistent implementation at the classroom level is key to these positive outcomes. So I believe now we have another poll for you. Do these findings surprise you? And I would welcome anybody to insert into the chat box or in, onto Twitter any aha moments they had as I was presenting the findings, any way in which these findings are relevant to your work in the field. So I see some people were, the you know, majority of people were surprised by some of the findings here, which is great. Um, I'm glad to uh, provide any new, um, new information that may be helpful for you uh, moving forward. Um, so before I hand this off, I did want to point you to the CBE 360 toolkit, which AIR put together with, um, with continued funding from the Nellie Mae Education Foundation. And I believe we are going to insert a link to these, uh, this toolkit, which is freely available. Um, essentially, it is our teacher and student surveys measuring CBE implementation. We have a user's guide, uh, which takes you step by step through the survey administration process. Uh, we have uh, the surveys, uh, paper versions of the surveys, as well as a survey monkey template. So if you have a survey monkey, account you can use our template and adapt it as however you see fit in order to ease the admin uh, survey administration burden um, we have a construct map so you see how each of the survey questions map onto the key features of cbe that we focused on in our study um, we provide example consent forms survey administration instructions just guidance if you are not as familiar with the survey administration process um, and the technical appendix if you're interested in any of the survey property. And for my final slide, I just wanted to show you the steps that we go through in our survey user's guide. Um, so yeah, so uh, we, our uh, survey user's guide goes through the five steps of the survey. First, deciding if the surveys are right for you. Uh, both the teacher and student surveys, you are in no way um, required or even encouraged to use both surveys and all components of both surveys. Again, uh, step two, going through how you may adapt the surveys based on your own needs. Um, and then uh, step three, providing some guidance on survey administration. And then steps four and five, provide more guidance if you're not as familiar with uh, data analysis and presenting the findings. Uh, we provide some examples of how you may use tables and figures to show your results and then example language of how you might describe your findings. So with that, I want to thank you very much for taking the time today to let me talk about the research and I'm happy to address any questions that have come up. 
Chrissy, thank you so much. And this is such an interesting study and one of few that look at this link. So we're really excited that you could present today. Um, I do have some questions from the audience. Um, could you let us know what are the instructional practices included in variety of instructional practices? That is a good question and not one I have at my fingertips, but we do look at um, just the standard uh, stand and deliver uh, teacher presenting to the class. Um, and that I did want to point out that was common in all school settings. Um, even the CBE schools commonly said that that was an approach that they used with their students. Uh, we did have uh, collaborative group work and students' presentation to the class, papers, um, things of that nature. Um, but we did, I must say, uh, our instructional approaches and supports was the largest number of survey items that we had. We did address a use of technology and advisories and learning plans there, um, as well as measures of um, teacher uh, students uh, feelings of closeness with their teachers, senses that they felt supported by their teachers. Uh, we also included those measures in our survey. Okay, great. And just to note again, this study is available online and we provided the link in the chat box and we'll do so again. So if you do want to get deep into the weeds, um, you can do so by get, getting a copy of the study. Um, another question that came in, uh, were there any, any findings in support of increasing equity? Um, so, I would not say that our findings pointed to equity. What we did see, though, um, and I would say this uh, both with the CBE study and another study I conducted with Wendy Sir focusing on collaboration, was the importance of getting the students' experiences. Um, we, with that within school variation, you have to question is it just subject area? Is it just how students perceive it? Or is, um, is there some aspect where some, some students feel like they're being treated differently by their teachers? Um, so one example that came up for this other collaboration study was um, some students felt that they were given autonomy because they could direct their own learning and other students reported that they were being abandoned by their teacher because they were told to go off and do the work on their own but they didn't feel adequately prepared to do so. Um, and so that's where, while I say that we don't encourage people to use either, you know, both the teacher or student survey, if you had to choose, I would say the student survey, because I think it is important to use the student survey to really collect information on how students are perceiving their experiences and to make sure um, if you disaggregate the data by race, ethnicity, by low income status, you could see if there are meaningful differences in students' experiences. Right. Um, someone asked, we would love to hear your views about the significance of school and district policy and procedures in areas of pedagogy and grading practices, both of which are treated as hands-off by schools and school systems. Um, I'm probably not the best person to address those questions. I am more of the data analyst. Um, however, we did observe that um, flexible pacing while being the key, what I would call the key feature of CDE was probably the hardest to implement uh, because you cannot move students into the next grade level until the next school year. That's usually a district-wide policy. Um, there were very few settings where they are able to actually implement flexible pacing to the extent that CDE would, would need. Um, so certainly, I think that um, the key feature of the CBE 360 toolkit is to be able to see, well, where are we able to achieve uh, implementation with fidelity and what policies may need to change and how can we take these data to the district to say, this is why you need to change the policy because we're not able to um, really implement flexible pacing or uh, flexibility and assessment practices because there are policies in place that would prevent us from actually achieving that. And um, one final question. You mentioned the CBE 360 resource for schools and districts. Is this something that would benefit a school or district at any stage of CBE implementation, even at very beginning stages? Absolutely. And in fact, I probably was supposed to say that these are supposed to be used for formative purposes only. Um, for our research, it was really to gauge what is the level of implementation of CBE, even among these schools that were supposed to be the model examples of CBE. Uh, we encourage 
schools at all levels um, to use these surveys just to see, you know, take the pulse on where they are, see where they might need to provide additional resources or training. Um, because a lot of times there are policies that are implemented or practices that are encouraged that teachers are not prepared to to implement. And so uh, I think that these surveys are a great way to just assess where you are at the moment, uh, maybe assess at the beginning and at the end of the school year to measure change over time, um, or across school years or across grade levels to see if levels of implementation are easier to achieve um, at the higher grade levels than the lower grade levels. Um, but definitely at all, you know, whether you're just beginning at CBE or if you've been at it a long time, just to get a realistic view, both from teachers and students, about um, how that implementation is going. Great. And again, that's a free resource. So that, that's excellent. Um, and thank you so much again, Chrissy. Uh, I'll now pass it over to Lisa Bellotta and Eric Lasky from the Ridgewood High School. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, Eric Lasky, Lisa Bellotta, we have been at competency work now, working on competencies within Ridgewood High School for going on our fourth year. I can go ahead and go on to that next slide. I want to tell a little story about the very first year we started uh, competency within uh, the school and our students' reaction. And we started in our math classes and because our math realized, hey, we need to make some changes. And we started with, we're like, let's use a different approach to make sure that we reach all students. And we no longer wanted students to sit in a classroom and move on to the next classroom maybe not quite ready, maybe passing with a C or D. We want to make sure that they knew all the material they needed to. They learned all the skills before they moved on. And so we started Compton Education, and a month into it, we kept getting a lot of students' complaints, students' concerns. So we went and visited all the Compton classrooms, and we asked them, go ahead and write down what are your complaints, what are the problems, you know, what is wrong with what we're doing? And it's amazing that, you know, they all wrote separate things, but there's basically three things that every student wrote and what they didn't like. And here's what they told us. They said, we want, and this is what they wanted from their teachers, we want our teachers to tell us what to do, tell us when to do it, and tell us how to do it. And Lisa, what was your reaction to that? Well, my answer was there's only two places for you to go after high school. That would be a factory or the military, because that's the only thing we'd be preparing you for. So obviously, we had been doing it wrong for a long time. Uh, to go ahead and go to the next slide. You know, this is, you know, we, we took a look at the portrait of a graduate. And from our portrait of our graduate, we came up with our graduation competencies. These demonstrate the skills that we want for every one of our students when they graduate. And these skills actually, there's a rubric for each one of these, and uh, for each of these competencies, there's, there could be multiple skills within them. And there is a rubric, and in that rubric, it shows where the student should be, you know, demonstrating that they are ready, ready to graduate from Ridgewood High School. Um, you know, you'll see we have these you know, there's different words that people use. Knowledge, skills, dispositions are one of them. Um, we wanted to make sure that it was more in a language that our students and our parents would understand. And you can sort of see, instead of using those, we, you know, we chose the life and career innovation and our learning skills. And you're not going to see uh, math in there. You're not going to see English. You're not going to see social studies. But you're going to see the skills that these students should be walking away with from these classes. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so we've, what we've done in the next few slides is kind of give you, um, even though we said that we've only been doing competency ending our fourth year, we actually set a foundation for competency long before. And it started way back in 2011 and 12 when we started training our teachers on project-based learning. We were doing um, universal by design models. And we went to a formative um, and summative assessment model. And that one drew the most criticism from teachers because for the first time, homework didn't count. So their answer would be is, why would kids do homework if it doesn't count? And we went through a, a big learning curve with that. 
Um, one of the big changes that it helped us in our transition as well is when we went one to one. One of the reasons why we had very little trouble um, transferring over with this uh, COVID pandemic is that we were already one to one for so many years from 2013. So our, our kids were very well uh, versed in blended learning, for example. Um, but one thing I do want to touch on in the same year in 2013, our superintendent hosted a World Cafe. And in that World Cafe, there was every stakeholder you could imagine, from a community member all the way down to a student. And they were asked to define a Ridgewood graduate. And nobody ever defined we wanted them to be able to, you know, to do calculus, for example, or read Romeo and Juliet. What they did ask for are the 21st century skills. They wanted them to communicate. They wanted them to collaborate. They wanted them to be, to be professional, basically. Um, and from that vision process, we took that work, and that vision had never been fulfilled. And that vision is what took us four years ago when we joined the competency pilot, it took us to designing those graduation competencies that Eric just went over with you. But the big thing that we wanted to touch on with you today was our why. We were asked to speak to you about at-risk students and we noticed that one of the questions was um, about how does this help with equity? And that is what we were looking for. 50% of our students, since I've been in the district since 2002, did not meet college and career readiness standards. Um, it didn't matter if we were doing RTI or UBD or MTSS or ILS. Um, you can use any acronym you want. Those were all the reforms, all the initiatives, and none of them equated to closing the achievement gaps for our subgroups. And our two major subgroups at Ridgewood High School are growing subgroups are our free and reduced lunch students and our Hispanic students. Um, and we were failing them. We were failing our students. They were not college and career ready. So when this opportunity came four years ago to jump on this pilot, we took it and we ran with it. Um, and that is where we kind of um, are moving up the timeline. So if you can go ahead and go to the next slide, we can keep talking here. Yeah. Eric, and you if you look at this, over? yeah. If you look at this next slide, you'll see things that we put in and we changed. And really all these things in these next year and a half, we're trying to personalize learning, find out what the student's interests are and relate that, you know, take the curriculum and relate it to them and try to let them choose how they wanna learn stuff and how they wanna apply stuff. So we started, even before competency, we started on trying to personalize learning for each student and finding out what motivates them and what do they wanna do. As you go on to the next slide, You'll then see uh, team the Illinois State Board of Ed Competency Pilot, which Angela Hamilton is uh, in this conference and she's part of Illinois State Board of Ed that, and a big part of the competency pilot and even continuing at that. And our superintendent basically came to us and said, this is now a tool we can use for all this work we've been doing and for the vision that we've seen for our students. And we jumped on that right away. Uh, we had one week to complete this. Uh, we worked on it pretty much all day for that whole week, got ourselves, it was about a hundred page paper and then, because we're like only 10 schools were gonna be accepted and we put all the time and energy in and we submitted it and we were accepted into the pilot. And then we knew, all right, we're there. How are we gonna start this? What is first? Um, most schools chose, uh, you know, within that pilot, the first year was supposed to be, all right, first year planning and then after that implementing, we really we didn't want to wait we didn't want to plan because our superintendent always tells us planning is great but every year you plan you just lost a group of students and we decided you know talked about it we were like all right math is going to be all in on this we we're going to move with that and then we also had a couple other like english uh one also wanted to jump in and start this and start to get you know see how it works and then there's some components that we implemented across the whole school. If you go ahead and go to the next slide. And you can see that since we've, we've started that, there's some other things that we've now implemented and realized if you don't have these components, 
you're not going to have the success. And Lisa, you want to talk about advisory? Okay, so I wanted to speak to um, somebody brought up earlier in, in, in the in the uh, questions about how um, what were those instructional practices, uh, and I wanted to speak to it here. So the instructional practices for competency ed are things like project-based learning. They're things like teacher facilitated learning. They're things like blended learning, personalized learning. You've heard all these buzzwords, but there's one piece that the kids struggled with that first year, and that was that disposition piece. Nothing to do with knowledge acquisition, but that professionalism. Were they maintaining attendance were they ready to learn? Were they there with their materials? Were they able to stay on task? But the most important, what we learned, was managing deadlines. This was our biggest pushback because when you use words and use them carefully, I warn you, Minnesota, when you use words like anytime, anywhere learning, self-paced learning, self-directed learning, all of those things have deadlines attached because the real world, the authentic world, has deadlines. We had a deadline to be ready for this presentation today, as an example. So we actually incorporated professionalism, a competency of professionalism that includes managing deadlines into our curriculum. So 20% of our students' grade comes from professionalism, and that is one grade that is fed from all the courses. So if you are, let's say you're a kid that just loves math and you manage all your deadlines, in fact, you are ahead of the curve, you work forward because you're a kid that it's too slow in algebra, you're moving on, you're gonna earn your credit in geometry, which most students do. But in English, they hate to read, they don't like to write very much, they tend not to meet their deadline fair. This grade helps keep them uh, in line. It helps feed us that this is truly how they're demonstrating mastery and professionalism. And that's the key, is demonstrating mastery. Demonstrating mastery of learning, demonstrating mastery of skills, demonstrating mastery of all those competencies that we showed you in the beginning. And how do they do that? They do that by performance assessment. When they are demonstrate their learning, they are demonstrating with performance assessments. Objective tests are a thing of the past. The only time you might see objective questions are in formative work. And if a student is doing a cold read, they might answer with objective questions, but it's always more just a cold read, nothing that they've seen before. The other piece that I wanted to touch on that is a huge part of our competency is the freshman, uh, what well, started with freshman advisory. It's actually an all school advisory model now. That advisory piece is kind of the glue that holds it all together. So that advisory piece is that every student has a one-to-one -one advisor. We have staff members, including our principal and the head of our um, maintenance department that are freshman advisors. They go through a long, um, they go through a long, process to get vetted actually and we best match kids to their advisor because they will have that advisor for all four years. That advisor helps them determine a career pathway. They will help them with their um, social emotional well-being. They get one-to-one -one meetings with them almost daily um, and there's only one advisor for around 12 students. They also help monitor their students success plan. Every student receives an individualized learning plan, not to be mistaken with an IEP. This is a student success plan that drives their high school experience, if you will. Um, Eric, do you want to go in a little bit and talk about the interdisciplinary work? Did we lose you, Eric? Sorry. Right, no. We can As you look at, okay. As you look at, the overall picture of what we've done, if you go ahead and move on to the next slide. The question we want to ask you is like, you saw our journey and we know that each school probably has their own journey of what they've done that can lead into going into competency. So you've probably done things in the past that will make the transition much easier for you. And those are, that's what our purpose of, of sort of showing our timeline was, is what have you done that will help you move? As you go to the next slide, 
you'll see the one component about competency education is that it's not about focusing on one thing. It's not focusing on math. It's not focusing on the reading. But it, what it is, is trying to allow students to do projects or performance tasks where they're actually using all of them. There's, it's, it's no longer learning in silos. It's actually learning everything together. And it's a focus of, in every class, of focusing on not just the knowledge, content knowledge, but the skills and dispositions that they're gonna need and giving them feedback on those things. You know, at Ridgewood, we're looking at more interdisciplinary stuff, as many projects as we can. We have our freshman team, they come up with projects where there's gonna be writing, problem solving, presentation skills, and those are the experiences we wanna provide our students because those are gonna demonstrate what the real world is. If you go ahead now to the next slide, and Lisa, if you wanna talk about um, lessons learned. So our lessons learned, um, just to, to wrap it up. Um, one, performance, is, performance tasks. Everything is demonstrated, they're learning through performance tasks. Students should not take a performance assessment until they have demonstrated the learning necessary in which to do that performance assessment. Number two, the framework has to be in place. Our competencies have gone through an implementation cycle and feedback cycle two times around. We take feedback, we make changes, we are constantly calibrating student work, setting anchor tasks, and working on our iterated reliability. The big one, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. This is messy, messy work. You will take many, many hits uh, going forward, but it's for the good of the kids and it's for equity. Um, finally, we learned in trying to create different kinds of teams, the best team to form when you are moving forward and piloting this work is the coalition of the willing. Trying to pull the laggards um, really is a uh, it's too hard. And this kind of work is, is hard and it's messy and coalition of the willing is who you need to ask for. Transparency is another lesson learned. You have to be transparent. You need to tell you all of your stakeholders what you're doing and get their feedback. And finally, you have to remember that in knowledge versus behavior, that just because a student might know something and might be very good at something, doesn't mean that they have the grit to follow through and finish. And that is what we're teaching is the grit. As many as, you know, as we've, as we've had to shift to e-learning, and I know with Illinois, you know, they have basically a policy, like your grade cannot go down over the, you know, over this e-learning. And the one thing about competency is students control their grades more than anything. And that's been a shift that we had to switch with the grading policy because once again, we don't even give students you know, performance tasks. We make sure that they're ready before we give them assessment. Uh, Lisa, do you want to talk anything more about how competent with our company system, things have not had to change much? Yeah, I'm just gonna COVID? wrap it up with that just because this is where we are in remote learning. There are no, there's no educational harm when you do competencies because what's happening is kids are being met where they are and being asked to demonstrate what they've learned. We have used um, this COVID pandemic to get kids to write about what's going on in their lives. Um, they've shown evidence of, of, of their writing through um, how they stay healthy. They have showed um, evidence of how they can create uh, the scientific method through doing um, uh, uh, graphs and things like that on their physical fitness and well being. Uh, we take whatever we have and we've been able to make the transition because of it. And then I know somebody's asked this and we'll get to that in the Q&A, but yes, because our modules were already posted on our learning management system, again, our change process to remote learning was really without a blip. So this is truly anytime, anywhere. Sorry. All right. Now we can go to questions. Sorry about that. Lisa and Eric, thank you so much. Um, I'll get to questions in a second. I just want to acknowledge that we are having some audio issues with feedback and we're working to uh, manage that better. Um, I also want to remind everyone that we do have the closed captioning option available, which can sometimes help with the, um, the audio issues as well. 
Okay, so Lisa and Eric, we have a lot of questions. I also want to note that any questions we don't get to, um, we will work through the chat box to get those answered for um, attendees. So thank you all for sending in some really great questions. So first one, should we be concerned about how flexible pacing could affect a four-year graduation timeline? Absolutely not. I love that question. I love it. Because um, here's the truth. As teachers, I've been in this business for about 25 years. We always, right, we're always teaching to that middle. When we talk about that four-year timeline, most students will be in that four-year timeline. When you're talking about outliers, you're talking about the small percentage of lows and then the, high, you know, the small percentage of super highs. Those small percentage of super highs, what you're doing for them is you're giving them dual credit options, you're giving them internship options. You're doing, they're still part of your four year plan, but now they're just getting more college credits while they're with you. That's for the high kids. Now, what about the lower kids? The lower kids, we have interventions in place. We have, we use most of our title funds for tutoring. We have extended school year where kids are no longer retaking whole courses. They're just taking the portion that they did not master. So we have not run into anyone that has not finished within the four years. Okay. Um, can you speak to how switching to Canvas, and you might just wanna give a mention about what Canvas is, mm -hmm. made a difference in your CD implementation? Um, the commenter said, I've been trying to get my school on board for over a year. So Canvas has been our learning management system since 2013. So our teachers had professional development for years using Canvas. Um, so for us, it wasn't a matter of switching. What it was a matter of now all teachers were on board and they were now more consistent with creating the modules. And yes, having, it doesn't have to be Canvas, having a learning management system is a crucial, essential element to competency-based education. Um, here's a comment that we wanted to recognize. Students don't know what they don't know about their own learning because we have been doing education to students instead of allowing students to understand why learning is necessary and grow to love their learning experience with purpose and agency. Students will have to learn how to learn differently and be engaged from the beginning. Any reflections on that? That is probably the biggest thing. I and mean, when people ask about that, Competency education is about students being able to control, because once they, they're going to leave us and they're going to go off to college and then they're going to go to career, we want them to know how they learn best. We want them to know how to manage deadlines. You know, that's, the, that's just the real world. And the thing we've noticed is, you know, from those three questions I mentioned earlier when we switched this, is that's not what students are used to being told what to do and then doing it. And we want them to take control and we want them to tell us, yeah, how are you going to demonstrate mastery of learning instead of us always saying, here's how you're going to do it. Great. What role do the parents play with students and advisors? So the parents are, again, we use full transparency. Um, our parents do have access to Canvas with a parent view. Our parents are invited on multiple occasions to um, come to the school, to email with us. We've had parents come in for one-to-one -one meetings. Um, students uh, will email their parents evidence of their competencies as we go along. Again, we are a high school district, so you don't often have as much parent uh, collaboration as we'd like, but the parents that are involved do get the transparency that they are looking for. And the nice part about the advisory model is now if a student is struggling, they're not going to have three or four teachers that are calling home. Those teachers will talk to the advisor and then that advisor will be the connection with the parents. Especially right now with e-learning, e it's been great having that advisor relationship to communicate. Absolutely. Um, someone asked a clarification question. Is 20% of every course grade comprised of professional skills? The answer is yes. And that grew out of the feedback that it was needed. 
And have you all reviewed the data on the professional competency and broken that down by multiple subgroups? We, um, we have. Um, and actually, these, the group that we were struggling with most with meeting deadlines uh, were our at-risk learners. Um, and we actually, because of their feedback, student feedback, we have stuck with what we're doing. Our students actually have come around to believing that they actually need professionalism. So the, the data has been positive. Yes, our um, freshman on track numbers are higher, our graduation rate is higher, our um, attendance rate is higher, our truancy rate is, is, is better. Um, yes, the data is showing what we need to show. Yeah. And we have actually finally, we've been trying to, uh, we finally our achievement gap with our Hispanic students has finally closed as well. Yes, that is what we are most proud of. It is truly showing equity. Great. Um, what was the process to create the performance task? Long. <laughs> so, um, first of all, most of your districts are doing performance tasks. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of performance tasks that you've been doing for, for the long term. Um, for example, writing an essay is a performance task. That's, that's a huge one. Um, uh, doing a science experiment and creating your own experiments and testing and doing your own data, that is a performance assessment. Doing cold reads is a performance assessment. Doing a presentation is a performance assessment. Again, like Eric mentioned, there are many performance assessments that you have been doing for the long term that are actually can continue on. You are not reinventing the wheel. Yes, we're transforming education, but you're not reinventing everything. Um, can you talk more about learning required prior to taking assessment? How much time do you give students? It, it depends on the unit. So if we have, um, if it's a, um, let me give you an example. Uh, like we start the year, uh, or in the middle of the year, we do a college and career planning um, unit for career exploration. That unit happens to be about two weeks. The, per, the performance assessment for that unit is a presentation to an authentic audience, somebody in their career pathway, for example. In order to do that, they have to complete X number of things, X number of assignments. They have to do interest inventories. They have to do um, a research project. They have, to do, um, uh, they have to do many interviews to prepare for interviewing a professional that sort of thing. So it depends on the unit. It, 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 it all depends. Okay. How do you, how did you re-engage or re-motivate students who are years behind their peers? Is there a track to make up prior years lost? You know, that's, that's a great question. And to be honest, those are the students that we saw really early on that were finally starting to excel because it's, you know, competency based education is also about meeting students where they are and getting them to grow. And in the past, we always just put everybody in that pile and said, here's where you're at and let's try to move you along and we realize that's not working. Um, and then they'd be embarrassed to ask questions in class because now people aren't going to think I'm smart or I'm going to hold up the class. So when we're able to, to switch to that, we actually are able to meet kids a little bit more where they're at. And the whole point of that is. Like, if you look at what the classroom model is, it's no longer, uh, you know, the teacher up there talking to the students. It's the students engaged in activities. It's about grouping the students where they're at to provide them the supports they need. It's about doing mini lessons. That's another thing people think, oh, you switch the competency, there's no more direct instruction. No, that's not it at all. But the direct instruction is different. The direct instruction will be for one group and more direct instruction for another group. So there are more mini lessons. And by making this switch, and once again, the teachers, we have some teachers that are doing an excellent job. What they do is, because all the curriculum is already on our, you know, is on Canvas, so they're not planning curriculum, but what they're doing is they do exit flips to figure out what are the students' needs, and then their, their planning is actually grouping those students and then providing those, you know, providing the students with each of their individual needs. So they so use now, data you know, to you inform work, their instruction daily. I think that's an important message. Yeah. And so now a kid in the past may have sat a class in class completely lost, being non-productive, and now every day the students are productive in class and they are growing in class. 
Lisa and Eric, thank you so much for sharing your experience today. As you can tell, we had a lot of questions from attendees. Um, I see, and I attendees, see in the your chat box, I feel so badly that we can't get to them all. So yes, we'll continue to field those questions to you both as we continue on and try to, to get everybody some, some answers. But thank you so much again for, for coming and talking with us today. I'm gonna leave you a message um, though, guys. You can come whenever we're back to school. We do invite you to come for a tour and hear from the teachers and students live. So maybe that'll help you in your journey. Great, thanks again. Okay, I'm now gonna pass it over to Jeff Clayman and Sally Reynolds from MBE. Good afternoon. This is Sally Reynolds. And hey, it's Jeff Plowman. Um, I really appreciate the point at where we're at um, in, in this presentation because I think we get to reflect and um, all through the presentation, I was like, oh gosh, yeah, that sounds very familiar. Um, and again, we're coming at it from a um, state technical support um, perspective. Jeff, do you have any? Uh, no, I'll, I'll just, you know, add in in a minute. Thank you. Okay, so we can move on to the first slide. Um, we came to this uh, after the Every Student Succeed Acts um, identification of secondary programs came out in the spring of 2018. And for the first time in our state, uh, high schools were identified for the four-year grad rate. And about 80% of the 200 alternative school programs, which serve mostly at-risk youths who are off track to graduate, um, were identified under ESSA. And this um, was a result of, so using the 2016 four-year grad rate, a lot of the alternative programs, um, we, it, they ranged in graduation rate from 0% to 100%, um, with the average being about 25%. And again, they were serving students who were primarily um, at risk and coming to them at all different times. Um, when folks would ask us, you know, why is this? Uh, that, that these programs, you know, are, have such low graduation rates. Um, other than anecdotal examples, we didn't really have an opportunity um, to get down into the detail as to why that was or what the practices were in the alternative programs. Um, we quickly partnered with RHEL Midwest, and I want to just also acknowledge Jeff Plowman has been a great um, partner in pushing this work along with Dominique Bradley and certainly our supervisor, um, Mary Berry has supported our interest in delving into um, the practices in programs that don't fit the traditional mode. And so we started with a survey in July of an environmental scan of the practices of the credit recovery programs. Um, we sent out 505 requests for the survey and we got 250 across traditional high school settings, charter high school settings, and the alternative programs in the state. And um, we realized that we needed to get at a little more, so we did 17 qualitative deep dive interviews um, with those, with a few identified respondents to try to get a good rounding. Um, what the data showed us was um, not fully surprising, but that most programs, um, students were retaking the entire course, again, during the core school day, and ultimately putting them farther and farther behind because they couldn't access that semester or that term's um, courses. Um, a lot of secondary programs offered students um, limited access to credit recovery, uh, usually two to four weeks in the summer would be if they could get in. Um, the findings also highlighted, um, you know, the high degree of variability about the when, the where, the how, and um, even who could access credit recovery um, in our state. And this really impacted student access and success based on whether they could even get to a credit recovery course before they were 
scheduled to um, graduate. Uh, at the same time, sort of as these were all spinning out, we also um, worked with a cohort of schools to kind of get a grasp of what they were um, dealing with related to creating more flexibility, um, moving from following the traditional high school program in making students um, take the entire course again. And um, that also then spun into working with where we're at right now, the network improvement community uh, that we, um, that REL, uh, again, we're partnering, we love REL Midwest, um, to get at the practice piece, because what we realized is that it really is that mindset um, that everyone has referred to up until now about it has to be this way and really being able to open it up to accept student choice and some of the other pieces that we will um, get into. But it's also, um, we're starting another virtual uh, NIC for rural communities, rural programs, alternative programs in the state as well. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so really professional development and Jeff and I really came from that. How do we support our teachers um, and programs to, to get their minds around this and to move this practice? And um, based on the scan and the cohort work, um, it became clear that there were just a lot of misconceptions around the who, what, where, and when of offering personalized learning um, that can focus students on competencies instead of tasks. Um, or more arbitrary things. And so that credit recovery really gave us that um, basis to look at looking at CBE opportunities for students along a continuum of credit recovery supports. And we sort of found those living in um, the systems of curriculum, flex, a more flexible um, schedule, access to curriculum, and flexibility around instructional practices. Um, next slide. So first is the flexibility around instruction. And again, the scan um, quantified and said that about a third of the programs of the 250 that responded, a third of them thought that seat time, the hours that a student was um, sitting with their butts in a seat, is how you assign credit. Now the problem is, is if they, we also have those policies that others have referred to, you miss 10 days and you automatically fail. So it isn't based on what a student can demonstrate mastery of, it is based on something completely more arbitrary, arbitrary and probably out of the hands of the student. So we um, look to set up guidance around looking at what does a flexible schedule look like that's not on the school program terms, but based on student needs. And so creating systems um, that are not about having a butt in a seat, but could be hybrid, that blend in-person and distance learning to accommodate um, students' schedules um, of working or childcare, expanding schedules to include uh, options for students that are outside of the, the traditional and um, encapsulated uh, course times. And then looking at, uh, systems that facilitate that students can have choice. So this day I may be here this time, but tomorrow I won't be able to be here until this time and allowing that choice and flexibility for students. Take it away, Jeff. All right, so I'll jump in on the next slide. So I'm going to talk about flexibility and access to curriculum. So when we started this work, we noticed that there were some uh, programs effectively using pre-assessment to guide their instruction in credit recovery courses, but it wasn't a widely used strategy. Um, pre-assessment is useful because it can pinpoint the areas in curriculum that need more or less attention. Teachers are the ones who should be assessing for that understanding um, and adjusting the curriculum and instruction methods accordingly. This then allows for students to spend less time repeating what they already understand and can allow them to concentrate more time and energy on where they need it. So the pre-assessment can really reveal gaps in knowledge from previous courses that were left unaddressed as well. 
And if those things um, remain being unaddressed, those things are likely to, you know, keep um, impacting the student in that subject down the road. Potentially, this would allow students to recover credit at a faster rate as students earn credit based on when they demonstrate understanding rather than the duration of the term of the course. So we encouraged, again, coupling this idea with the flexibility of schedules so that students were able to do, for example, a credit recovery math. And when they earned credit in one course for however long that took them by demonstrated mastery, they could automatically roll them into the next course and not have to wait for the end of the term. So that was one of the um, you know, brilliant solutions that Sally helped you know, um, illuminate for districts. So um, the other thing that we think is important here to note is that in the age of high stakes external validation of learning via testing, teachers may need explicit confirmation of their professional capacity to discern whether or not students have demonstrated understanding of the standards. Teachers can reclaim their professionalism to apply standards-based criteria to determine when students have met standards and received credit. So we think there's an element here and an opportunity to really kind of um, reinvigorate that assessment competency um, that teachers may um, need to focus on going forward. Digital curriculum, of course, um, can in some subjects uh, be adaptive and respond in a variety um, of ways and provide less of the practice that students already understand and more of what they need. Teachers can support that flexibility outside of the digital curriculum by creating customized project-based learning experiences. And these experiences mash together standards across multiple um, subject areas into um, a project that has an element of student choice. Exciting work is happening in Minnesota with a group of six schools as well that I'm working with on a project that are at different stages of exploration and development of technology platforms to support the creation of alternative transcripts that include demonstrated competencies in academic and non-academic learning. Our career and college readiness domains and competencies, which I had dropped into the chat box early on, um, provide districts with a good starting place to identify important skills that students should obtain during their pre-K-12 education. But schools may want to likely take these, modify and adapt them for their local communities. But at least we're providing a starting point. Next slide, please. All right, so in terms of instructional practices, um, a typical credit recovery course sets up a power differential where teachers have the power to determine what to teach, how it's taught, how learning will be assessed among other things. By providing students with more agency to determine how they will demonstrate their learning, they're more likely to follow through and complete the work and meet these goals that they have set for themselves. So linking this back with the access to curriculum Larger projects that include standards for multiple areas can support recovery of several credits at once through um, students demonstrating mastery of those standards. And that's really what we're looking for, especially in a credit recovery situation, to get students through um, and get them back on track. So um, some of the work that we've been doing now includes work with pilot programs who've created flexible schedules, curriculum, and instruction together. One suburban ALC that we work with shifted their schedule to create uh, space for hybrid credit recovery blocks in the morning and regularly scheduled courses in the afternoon. Students um, earned more credit more quickly since the shift in practice and policies and structure had taken place. And uh, we've been working most recently on equitable grading practices. We believe that equitable grading practices are a great place to begin competency-based um, education conversations, and they're necessary if um, competency-based is actually going to uh, gain a foothold. So you might as well start there. Teams of teachers can begin having honest conversations about how grades are determined in their courses. This should begin at the team level, we believe. And, you know, we just want to get away from eliminating common practices such as uh, assigning points for class participation, attendance, homework completion, and neatness. All of those things 
um, have baked in advantages for some students over others and highlight teachers' personal biases um, that are based in their own lived experiences. So we're really, you know, kind of leaning into the work from Thomas Gusky and Joe Feldman, who provide um, really good examples for how to begin this. Um, Sally, I think you referred to the NIC. Did you have anything further to say about how the NIC is going to lead into this? Um, no, they ref so it was, ref uh, I think Susan referred to what, how that's evolving um, and that we're expanding that, that the, partic the teachers that participated this year are gonna become trained the trainers. We're developing a toolkit and we're creating a virtual um, Nick for our rural communities in the state. All right, so as we move on to the next slide then, this is our last slide in the presentation. So moving CBE forward in Minnesota, um, really what we need to do, I mean, what we can do right now, I guess is what we'll say, um, is keep working directly with teachers and school-based teams. I think that is our strategy that Sally and I can access, certainly, um, to, to support increased flexibility and expand student choice and schedule, how and when they access their content, and how they demonstrate understanding. I think um, Sally and I can really help people navigate um, between the rigid system that we kind of have set up for collecting things like how our students in attendance and be able to help people realize like how they can apply that in a flexible way that still meets our requirements for funding, for example. Um, this approach supports teacher professionalism in applying equitable assessment practices that award credit when understanding is demonstrated. And this includes making assessment for prior learning universal. Staff, um, including education leaders at the Department of Education, um, may not, nat uh, we do have naturally varying levels of experience, training, and practical knowledge of CBE, and we need to acknowledge that ourselves and, uh, you know, take necessary steps. So an expansion of CBE in Minnesota will really require a coordinated approach, starting with us and getting our terms straight and getting a team of, of people really committed to this in place um, and developing the core beliefs necessary to support schools as they are pushing us forward into CDE because that's really, um, I think, a fair assessment of how it's happening. Lastly, um, ongoing development of systems to support CB will be required, not in the least, which includes funding mechanisms that are not time or place based. So. Projects like I'm involved in, as I mentioned earlier, with IMS Global and the Comprehensive Learner Record will result in examples of next generation learning management systems and digital curriculum um, and more robust transcripts that demonstrate uh, that learning is more than just academic credit, but they're rich, verifiable examples of student competencies in both academic and non-academic subjects. And that's where we hope to uh, get to. So now I think, next slide. We're on to questions maybe. Okay, thank you Jeff and Sally so much. Um, I actually have a question. Um, is there someone in MDE a school or district can reach out to if they're considering starting to implement CBE practices? Um, and what resources are available now to schools and districts? So I already mentioned that we have um, the domains and competencies from the Career and College Readiness Resource Guide. And I think that provides a really great place to start in terms of thinking about competencies as a whole. Um, we don't really have a point person at MDE who is assigned the responsibility of looking after competency-based education. I would say probably Sally Reynolds and myself are the closest people to that work. And Sally's happy to take all your calls. Oh, I think what, <laughs> what, what, are, what we do know are programs um, that we usually uh, refer people to who have really focused on a piece of CPE work. And so it's really, like Jeff pointed out, the programs have pushed us 
to get more information to support them. And so we, we um, oblige by sending people right back to them yeah. to learn from them what they've learned. <laughs> and I think, you know, in, a, in all seriousness, like it will come through the, the type of program that they are, right? So if it's an online learning school that wants to move to CDE, like I saw one of my online school directors in here, at least that I work with, um, you know, she would come to me and say, hey, we want to do more CDE. Can you help us? If it's a charter school, we have the charter center, right? If it's a school leader, we have school leader support people. If it's an ALC um, or ALP, Sally would be um, the point of contact. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you again so much, Jeff and Sally. Um, we have just a few minutes left, so we're going to wrap up. But again, if you have questions for Jeff and Sally, please continue to submit them through the chat and we will uh, make sure that they get to the right place. All right, next slide. Thank you so much to our speakers for your time and all the great information shared today. Your feedback is very important as we plan future activities. Please take a moment to complete the survey to share your comments and feedback. We've shared a link in the chat box, but the survey will also open in a separate window as we conclude the webinar. Next slide. For our practitioners, REL Midwest will issue a certificate of participation in this professional development opportunity upon request. So if you would like to receive a uh, certificate of participation, please send an email to cgoldston at AIR.org and we will uh, give you one of those. We also want to encourage you to follow us on Twitter at REL Midwest and to sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date on additional resources and events. And we have a link to uh, the newsletter in the chat box that you can sign up. Okay, next slide. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us for a very informative and engaging webinar. Um, please feel free to reach out to any of the presenters if you have additional questions. And just as a reminder, the recording of the webinar and all the event materials will be archived on the REL Midwest website in the coming weeks. We will send an email with a link to the video as soon as it's available to everyone who registered for today's webinar. And again, though, please feel free to share that recording with anyone in your network who you think would benefit. Okay, next slide. Just a reminder that the study that Dr. Zeiser discussed is available to everyone online for free. Um, we will provide a link to that study in the chat box. Thank you all so much again, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening.